uh, this year. Now, before I get started, so I received the slides except from uh, Jill, and I'm not even sure Jill is here today. I haven't. Are you here? Let me ask directly. Okay, no, it doesn't look like it. Okay, very good. So then um, we're ready to go. Josefina, you have the, the first talk. Take it away. Okay, uh, well, um, good morning to you all. So I'm Josefina Catoni, and I will be talking to you uh, through my uh, current work in my, through my PhD thesis, thesis on uncertainty representations on variational inference models of visual perception. And this is a joint work together with Enzo Ferrante, Diego Milone, and Rodrigo Echeveste, who are my supervisors. So just to introduce myself, I am from Buenos Aires, Argentina. There I studied and obtained my degree on physics at the University of Buenos Aires. And later on, I moved to uh, the city of Santa Fe, where I am pursuing this PhD on engineering uh, at the University of Litoral. So as we've seen uh, yesterday and today, as, an, an, as you may all work with, uh, the topic I will be showing you, all these results, are on uh, machine learning specific for inference. So let us assume that we have uh, some input data X from which we want to make some inference of a variable which is unknown, uh, a non-observable variable Y, uh, which will come as the form of our output of machine learning method. But what about if not only point estimates of this Y variable uh, are needed, but if we also want some measure of the uncertainty of the sources, if uncertainty is actually important in our prediction. Uh, not necessarily a prediction in terms of a classification task, but uh, this could be us obtaining, for example, a low dimensional representation of our model. So we uh, would want to have um, an inference of a probability distribution for these latent variables Y from our input X, which could be uh, thought as a posterior of these Y variables from the input. So uh, in specific, we work on the neuroscience research and uh, for visual inference tasks, um, in particular of the primary visual cortex. So in this case, the machine learning tools will come as a form uh, of modeling a system of function. And our main hypothesis is that we will have a neuro, a artificial neural networks as neural models. And uh, we will think that it is possible to model the aspects of the brain uh, tasks by training these artificial neural networks uh, to do some relevant tasks for the brain in an optimal way, and then compare the, the emerging results of our artificial neural network to the uh, actual biological and physiological data. This would be like our goal objective. So this Bayesian theory of perception, we are, uh, the approach we are taking in, is that there is increasing evidence that the brain is actually capable of representing probability distributions in an approximate way and to, be, to perform probabilistic inference. That is, given an observation, we can infer some latent variable uh, that it is hidden, unobservable, from what we actually see uh, in, in, through our eyes. So uh, the model would be that there exists a, a generative model of that observation given some latent unknown variable and there is also a prior distribution for those latent variables. And uh, what we would desire to do would be make some inference of the latent variable out of the observation. Uh, some mat mathematical form for this would be the, the no really known Bayes theorem, which we, we could invert uh, the observation and the prior to obtain this posterior. But uh, for doing this, we should know what is our generative model, and we usually do not know our generative model if our system is too complex or if we have high dimensional data. So um, one way of modeling this could be, for example, using variational autoencoders. These VAEs uh, are extensively used in a lot of domains of machine learning for obtaining a, a low dimensional representation of these Y variables, this first part, the encoder, would do the recognition model part, the inference part, and then decode uh, this latent variable to obtain, finally, the generative model of the actual initial input. So this would be trained uh, as of having a reconstruction term in the cost function and a regularization term that will have a KL divergence between the posterior that we are trying to infer and the prior that we assume. So um, in this case, we would want some um, variational autoencoder to train on different inputs, for example, natural images, which we have already been uh, evolved as uh, living beings with visual tasks. 
um, to infer these kind of uh, posteriors that have uncertainty in a meaningful way, such that uh, non-informative images would have a high variance of our, or a high um, uncertainty. So what is uncertainty from a Bayesian perspective? Uh, we would expect that as observations become progressively more informative, we should have inferred posteriors with lower variance. I mean, with a lower um, a width of our posteriors inferred. While uh, if the observation is actually non-informative, non we cannot make any um, inference about it, we should get a, an inferred posterior that should match the prior. So in terms of uh, natural image statistics, this could be in the form, for example, of contrast. As contrast gets lower, we should infer a posterior uh, tending to the prior, while if the images have more contrast, we would be able to detect, for example, orientations or borders, at least in the primary visual cortex in the first early stages of visual processing. So this is what we would expect in, in this um, data, kind of data sets. So our main goals were to train these kind of artificial neural networks to perform Bayesian inference, and in particular, uh, audit these models in different visual tasks from different domains, and, um, and look about the capacity to represent uncertainty of these models. And what we found out uh, was that uh, classical VAE models uh, were unable to represent uncertainty in a meaningful way as we should expect. So uh, therefore, uh, well, this is uh, the classical VAE approach. We, um, uh, we proposed a new model, a variation of a variation autoencoder, which is the explaining away VA, which uh, incorporates this new latent variable set, which can be inferred also from the input. It will be a scalar variable, which will act um, multiplicatively in the end. So now our generative model will be this decoder from the Y latent variable, but at the last uh, step, we will multiply it scalarly by this set variable. This was inspired by the Gaussian scale mixture model, very largely used in natural images. And uh, surprisingly, as I will show you right now, uh, this had some favors um, properties for latent representations of uncertainty. So we did uh, experiments and trained these both models, both on, uh, for inference on natural images, um, having sparse uh, Laplace, um, posterior distribution for the Y variables, which are um, inspired uh, neurally those. And we also trained for inference on other classical computer vision uh, models, uh, such to have a more diverse uh, scope. For example, on the number, med, uh, number MNIST dataset, handwritten dataset, and the chest X-rays from MedMNIST. These were trained separately, each one of the models on the different datasets. So, well, some results, um, for example, on the inference of natural images, as I have been told, uh, telling you, you, we would expect to have this noise variance of the posteriors, I mean the uncertainty measure, to decrease as contrast gets higher. But what we found is that on classical uh, variational autoencoders, this remained almost constant, which would be the, gray, the green curve. Um, and even when contrast is actually zero, that is a blank image, we had the posterior with a very low variance and mismatching the prior level. While for the explain away variational autoencoder, the, the incorporation of this new uh, multiplicative variable um, resolved this problem by now having a decreasing uncertainty with contrast. And then going into other uh, classical computer vision problems, now, for example, when we trained with this MNIST dataset, uh, a nice experiment one could do to, to measure this uncertainty would be, for example, if we knew uh, one label or the other, uh, we could get an interpolation between different numbers, and we would expect that uncertainty become a high, at the highest level when we actually do not have uh, a representative number, but maybe a mixture of both, for example, as that mixture of zero and one at the same time. And what we found was that for most of the combination of different labels, um, this expected uncertainty uh, wasn't in the case of the VAE, 
While for the explain away one, we always had this uh, qualitative behavior of having a maximum in the, in the middle of the window uh, where, the, where we have numbers that are nor three or nor six in, in this case, for example. So this was uh, really interesting and we also uh, analyzed the case of, for example, medical images where uh, these are a very important domain, for example, for med uh, making medical diagnosis. And we found out that, for example, some measure of uncertainty in this case could be uh, adding uh, some Gaussian blur blurring or pixel noise in which if we were to get from a very informative image to a very pixel noised image, we would expect then to have a higher uncertainty when we don't have any information available. And by this, we have uh, trained the, um, the network only with the medical images. So this uh, weren't part of the data set. Uh, and we observed this expected uncertainty only for the explain away one, while the uh, classical VAE uh, had all the same level of, of noise variance. So, uh, okay, and uh, last but not least, uh, one uh, very kind surprise that we got was that uh, for autos distribution detection, we, this was also very useful. For example, if I train my model only on a, on a given domain, which could be, for example, my MNIST data set, but now came in with something the network has never seen. I mean, uh, I come with a chest X-ray or a natural image. So what would the uncertainty on the latent space be inferred by this model? Well, we find out that the VAEs for example, on the first column and the first row, you can see what is the input to our network trained on MNIST, only on MNIST. Uh, the second line would be the decoded image from this input. So for example, the VAE had um, a decoding that it is very similar to an 8 for an exact X-ray. And on the lower violin plots, you can see the um, uncertainty measure on the latent space. And this VAE had uncertainty for the X-rays, uh, very similar to the MNIST, while the explain away ones uh, give a, a higher uncertainty level and decodes them as blurry images. As I, I am not really sure what I'm seeing. I only know that I can project it to this space as a blurry image because I don't know what it is and I've been trained for this. Um, but I give you a high uncertainty level, a posterior with a high variance on the latent space. Um, so, if you are interested in watching some more results and the full work, you can find the preprint uh, which we uploaded in Archive a few weeks ago. And that's all. I think I'm on time, so uh, I'm open to any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was very nice and that was perfectly on time. So, we do have time for one or two questions. Where do we want to start? Maybe I can start because, um, so I was wondering, so I really like this idea of this explaining away, VAE, but in the beginning you also mentioned, you know, the connection to neuroscience, but then I lost a little bit where that came in, in the explaining away, VAE. Yeah, I'm, I didn't actually have the time, that's why I couldn't mention it. So, um, the, the way in which this connects to neuroscience is, let me just uh, show you this. So we assume that uh, the, the way in which our um, cortex works and can make inference on these postures is by making samples, by taking samples throughout time and that the neural activity will be as if taking samples from an inferred posterior. So is, this would be as traveling throughout the posterior throughout time. So uh, we would be able to train a, ideally, for example, a recurrent neural network to take samples from these distributions but for doing that, we need to know which are the postures we want to train on these recurrent networks. And uh, we can make some assumptions to, to simplify this problem, and that's the way in which, uh, for example, the Gaussian scale mixture model comes in uh, as giving a generative model with which we could invert it to get the posteriors. Um, but the VAE comes to solve the problem of generalizing a bit better on high dimensional state data and get uh, simultaneously the inference and the generative model at the same time. Okay, I see, thank you. Any other question for now? Yes, Jean. 
was very nice, thank you. Why is that called explaining away? Uh, why the introduction of the Z uh, relates to the... Yeah, uh, <laughs> maybe the, the name of explaining away uh, was, uh, if we, let me get to the architecture simplified here. So uh, the name comes as if this set variable comes to explain why, for example, for high contrast images, instead of having a, of, of needing to have high activations of the y variable, we can simplify this by having like a, a simple, more simple explaining variable, which is only a scalar variable uh, that multiplies and gets large when contrast is large, for example. Uh, it's a way of having more an explicable model in terms of less variables. And a final question. Um, what does the loss look like and how do you train the second map, the mm -hmm. cube so, side? Um, sorry. Uh, that yeah, was, that's all. <laughs> okay. So our training uh, cost function in this case would be only adding uh, here, ah, uh, no, I didn't get it. Okay, I'll come here. So the classical variational object encoder would be this. So as in our case, we have an independent, and this is the key point, it is an independent probabilistic variable which uh, does not interfere or it is not entangled with the Y variables. We can add a simple extra term, which is a KL divergence between now our set variable posterior and prior. So it is only an adding term of those KL divergences um, because those Y and Z variable are independent. So it is only that what's different. Okay, thanks. All right, well, let's thank you again. Thank you very much. And let's move to our next speaker. Yeah. Ah, okay, it works. Yes. yes. Okay. Maybe actually, let me, can I put it like this? That's better. All right, next up we have Ricardo Rende from CISA. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, thanks to the organizer for giving me this uh, opportunity. I'm really happy to be able to present my work uh, here. I'm a PhD uh, student at CISA, and uh, I'm working on um, uh, transformers. And uh, in this uh, presentation, I will talk about uh, factor red attention, POTS models, and uh, sequential learning in deep uh, transformers. Uh, the architectures that uh, I'm going to consider are uh, uh, transformer encoder, so uh, these bidirectional models that are uh, famous to be pre-trained under the masked language modeling task. Uh, that's a self-supervised task um, in which one starts with a big data set of many sentences, and then um, in each of these uh, uh, sentences, um, one or more words are randomly masked out, and the transformer is trained at uh, predicting them uh, by looking uh, at the rest of the sentence. Uh, the interesting thing is that while performing uh, this task, you can uh, see that uh, the, tra the um, transformer is actually learn how to solve many other different tasks, for example, on how to answer to questions. Um, and uh, I find uh, interesting uh, that we are also trained on this task when learning a new language. Um, the mathematical formulation of this problem is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, through the transformer, we are just trying to infer uh, which are the conditional uh, probabilities of having uh, one word in a specific posi position of the sentence given the other words in the rest of the sentence. And so, uh, our start starting point um, was trying to understand uh, which family of conditional distributions uh, can a transformer learn. Uh, in order to do that, we started by modeling the joint distribution 
over the language with a really simple model. Um, and so using this POTS Hamiltonian in which we have uh, spins uh, that are uh, uh, spins uh, that are uh, random variable that can take values in a discrete vocabulary, and so they model words. And um, in this model, we have only two body interactions uh, among uh, spins, so among words, and uh, with couplings uh, J, uh, depending on the positions uh, in which the spins are, and couplings U um, that quantify the similarity between the different uh, POTS colors, and so between the different uh, words. Um, so once we have this model, we can uh, write down the associated Boltzmann distribution, uh, that's the joint, and uh, we can sample it with uh, Monte Carlo methods. And um, in this way, we can obtain a data set of, con of spin configurations. Then for, uh, then for each of these sentence uh, sequence, as is done with uh, sentences, uh, we randomly mask one spin and we train the transformer at uh, predicting it. Um, what uh, we were able to show analytically is that uh, if um, one uh, takes one layer of uh, self-attention, uh, that's the uh, core building block of transformers, uh, and actually you make a simplification in which uh, from the attention weights uh, you drop uh, the dependence on queries and keys, and uh, in the values uh, you drop the dependence on positions. Um, obtained uh, what we call the uh, factored attention. Um, then the transformer makes a uh, prediction for the masked uh, spins um, with a functional form that can match exactly the uh, conditional distributions uh, associated to the POTS model um, that can be computed analytically in this uh, simple, uh, for, this, uh, yeah, for this Hamiltonian. And so um, uh, our first uh, key result is that uh, a single layer of factored self-attention trained under masked language modeling um, is completely equivalent to pseudo-like new methods for solving the inverse uh, POTS problem. Uh, also, uh, the um, factored attention is a bit simpler to be treated analytically, and we were able to compute the generalization error um, as a function of the sample complexity using the uh, replica method. And also, I would like to point out that uh, um, uh, the factored version uh, cannot be recovered in an easy way from the standard self-attention. Um, and so I think that for some applications, uh, this uh, version of the attention can be um, uh, better than the standard one. For example, in this paper, uh, they show that uh, factored attention can outperform the standard attention um, in uh, protein contact prediction. And also, uh, we are using uh, standard attention and we, are, and we have theoretical uh, motivations of why this is better than the standard, than the standard one in uh, building uh, um, quantum neural states, uh, as you will see uh, from the talk of tomorrow uh, by Luciano. Uh, okay, um, what's missing in uh, our uh, simple model um, for words that we have used so far are higher order interactions that, uh, of course, are present in uh, uh, natural language, and so we wanted to model them. Uh, so, um, uh, from the uh, two-body uh, interaction uh, so from the POTS model, uh, we um, considered um, Hamiltonians with higher order interactions. For instance, here uh, there's an Hamiltonian in which we have uh, four body uh, interaction among the uh, spins. Um, and so, uh, again, we want to understand whether the transformer can predict the missing spin uh, sampled uh, from the Boltzmann associated to this four body. Uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, the good thing is that uh, um, even in this case, the exact uh, conditionals can be computed, and so one can estimate the best four-body approximation of this dataset, the best three-body approximation, and the best two-body approximation. 
Uh, then uh, training uh, one layer of factored attention. Uh, okay, then we want to understand whether uh, we can learn these uh, um, higher order interactions among spins uh, by stacking uh, several layers of uh, factored attention. Uh, so, uh, starting with one layer, we have that uh, we learn exactly uh, the best two body approximation. This is not surprisingly since uh, they are the same thing essentially. Uh, but then uh, stacking two layers of factored attention, um, this is what you get. So you uh, first learn the best two body approximation and then uh, using the other layer, look, you can also learn the best three body approximation. Uh, training uh, three layers of factored attention, this is what you get. So again, you sequentially learn all the different uh, uh, order of interactions. Um, and uh, uh, so here uh, the uh, uh, um, the uh, two main uh, results uh, uh, it's uh, stuck to here because here is it's changing ah ah uh, ah uh, ah uh, it's uh, okay uh, there's some delay uh, okay. Uh, um, uh, okay, so uh, the main results here are, are that by stacking uh, several layers of factored attention, you can uh, um, uh, reconstruct uh, high uh, uh, many body interactions among the input uh, uh, spins. Um, and uh, an important detail here is that we are using X squared activation among the different layers. And also another nice thing is that this is this sequential learning that in this uh, um, toy setup, um, it's very clear and uh, it's uh, natural. Um, and so um, uh, uh, we uh, asked whether we can spot this sequential learning also when training a standard BERT model on, on a real uh, NLP uh, data set. Uh, now, uh, considering um, uh, a standard um, model, <coughs> Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, really optimized. <coughs> uh, there are, uh, for example, uh, uh, important building blocks like uh, layer normalization <coughs> uh, that uh, um, prevent uh, the, these uh, plateaus. Um, and so if you train a standard transformer, you will just see a smooth uh, um, test loss uh, curve without any plateau. Um, but then uh, we uh, thought that uh, maybe um, we can uh, use the models that we just uh, built um, to uh, create clones of a uh, real NLP dataset with a truncated uh, maximum degree of interaction among words. So for example, if we start from a, a real NLP dataset and we considered tiny stories, um, we know that by training two layers of factored attention with X squared activation on this uh, dataset, we uh, are going to obtain um, a good approximation of the um, uh, best three-body model that can uh, fit this data. Uh, then we can, uh, since those are generative models, uh, we can uh, sample them in order to obtain these clones of the original dataset uh, with maximum three-body interactions. Um, uh, and then uh, what uh, we can do is to consider a, a standard BERT architecture, so the standard transformer using queries and keys and uh, everything uh, standard. Uh, consider all, also a real NLP dataset, again, uh, 10 stories. And then we can train um, uh, BERT under masked language modeling on tiny stories. And uh, during the optimization, we can test the model um, on the clones uh, that we generated um, with a maximum degree of uh, 
uh, interaction that we can choose by uh, tuning the number of layers of uh, the uh, factored architectures. Um, and so this is what you get uh, during uh, uh, the training. Uh, at the beginning, uh, all the uh, test loss on these clones uh, um, uh, overlap, and it's good since uh, yeah, uh, at the beginning they should be the same. But then we can see that after uh, 20,000 steps, the uh, test loss on the three-body clone is uh, basically flat, maybe going up a little bit. Instead, the uh, test loss on the uh, clones uh, with uh, seven bodies interaction is still going down um, and so in the last stage of training the transformer uh, has already learned the three body uh, interactions among the words while it's still learning uh, something more complex uh, and so yeah we have this uh, sequential learning also in this uh, setup. Uh, okay, so to conclude, uh, I started by uh, proving the equivalence between a single layer of factored self-attention <coughs> uh, trained under masked language modeling and pseudo-likely methods for solving the inverse uh, POTS problem. Also, another important result is then that uh, by stacking several layers of factored attention with X squared, you can learn um, higher order uh, interactions uh, among uh, words, and you can precisely control the degree of interaction by tuning the number of layers. Um, uh, and uh, you can use this architecture to create clones of a, a real NLP dataset, on which then you can test uh, a standard model that you train on, a real data set, on the same real dataset, and uh, see whether uh, a sequential learning appears. You can check what the network is learning. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so these are my collaborators for this work, um, Alessandro and Sebastian that are my supervisor, Arsisa, and uh, Federica Gerace that's uh, also here. Thank you. Okay, there's a question. Which is good because I really can't ask any more questions on this. Uh, thanks, cool. Um, uh, so is the factors, factorized self-attention different from just like a linear layer with some kind of parameter sharing across the color dimension? Um, um, no, it, it, it's, uh, everything is linear, uh, but then, uh, yeah, you have these uh, uh, parameters sharing. Uh, yeah, uh, it's not uh, the same of a uh, linear layer applied to the uh, flattened sequence, yeah. uh, but uh, yeah, you have Two linear transformations. Uh, one uh, that's the same for each vector, that's the V, and then another linear transformation uh, along the other direction, uh, that's the length of the sequence. Cool, okay. Yeah, but it's linear. Okay, and then related follow-up question is, can you um, capture like the four-body interactions that you mentioned with a single layer of non-factored attention? Um, uh, that, okay, uh, so for, for example, inclu including uh, um, queries and keys. Uh, um, okay. Uh, 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 the thing is that uh, um, the uh, true conditionals uh, are those. Um, uh, with several layers of factored attention, uh, you can uh, basically match uh, those uh, with less parameters. If you have only one layer, uh, um, for example, in principle, uh, with only one layer of factored attention, if you take uh, x to the cube, uh, uh, x to the 4 activation, you can match these conditionals, but then you have only one set of parameters. Um, uh, I don't know precisely whether queries and keys can help uh, in this uh, task. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, uh, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Any, any, any other questions for now? Yeah, what do you? Uh, about the, the plot with Bert, is yes. the, the step size, is the real step size, right? There is no scaling. 
Yeah. Uh, so they they differ together, like the okay. No, just just to just to confirm. So there's yes. no scaling of learning rate or any parameter of the. No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, those are optimization steps. Uh, the thing is that uh, uh, here uh, one epoch is uh, um, uh, three thousand step. So here uh, it's actually three epochs. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, it's log scale. Yeah. Okay, very good. Let's thank Ricardo again. <laughs> and let's move to our last contributor talk for this morning. Very good. Okay, so last uh, contributed talk now by Konstantin Riedl from uh, TU München. Take it away. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me and uh, being here. Um, so I think my talk is a bit more theoretical than the ones before, but I try to keep it light and focus more or stay longer on the slides with uh, pictures giving some intuition than on the one with the mathematically rigorous theorems. Um, yeah, so, so I plan to give you some intuition about something uh, which was introduced in around 2017, consensus-based optimization, which is an algorithm to optimize non-convex um, functions. And before giving you this intuition, let me tell you something about the method. Um, so, so, so we want to find the global minimizer of a non-convex objective function, which we denote here by calligraphic E. So can I point here? Um, and we want to do this by employing a couple of particles which explore this function and in the end try to find a consensus about the global minimizer by somehow communicating and moving in a controlled fashion. So it's a bit aligned in um, the talks we had yesterday um, and, and for, for proving something we will take a mean field perspective, but I'll come to this later. So let me first tell you about the dynamic. Um, so as I mentioned, you have n particles, and each of them is steered by a stochastic differential equation of this form. Before you have a look, we will go through this uh, in more detail together, so don't be scared away uh, right away. Um, so I denote the particles by uh, xi. So these are the n particles, i is from 1 to n, and the um, position of each particle at time t is denoted by this, uh, this xik here. So here it's written in the time discrete setting. And each particle is subject to two forces, which uh, are these, um, which are these two terms, which I will explain in a second. But before that, I want to um, give you um, this very crucial um, um, objective or this very crucial point here, which um, somewhat gives the method its name and somehow steers its dyna dynamic. And it's called consensus point, and it somehow tries to approximate where these particles at some step k are moving towards. And um, so here below I plot just these n particles. Um, and here, so this um, consensus point is a weighted average of these n particles where the weights are given by the objective function and try to um, take into consideration how well the particles are positioned with respect to the objective function. So each particle which is located in a good position, so has a small objective function value, because recall we want to do minimization, uh, obtains here a high weight. Um, so because the weights are coming from a Gibbs distribution and are like e to the minus alpha times the objective function. Um, and particles which, uh, which are less well positioned uh, are attributed a uh, lower weight because they have a higher objective function, so their weight here is smaller. And here, I don't know if you can see it, but here I try to visualize this by particles um, depict, um, depicted more um, darkish, uh, which are in a better position and have a higher weight. And the consensus point now takes a weighted average of all these particles, taking into consideration the weights, and then is usually close to one um, the particle which is best positioned. 
Okay, so here alpha was pretty big, so the consensus point is closest to the particle with the lowest weight. And this might sound to the people familiar which have heard about particle swarm optimization, which is the same dynamic, just moves usually to the particle which is best positioned. But for analytical purposes, we um, relaxed, or the people who uh, had this idea of the method, René Pinot and others, relaxed this, um, this uh, definition and introduced this consensus point somehow to be able to have um, all particles being alike and not one particle being special at every step because it's the particle every other particle moves to. And then, as I said, um, the dynamic is um, driven by two terms. These are um, these two terms. So the first term is simply a consensus drift. So each particle moves to the consensus point. Um, this should be depicted here by the blue arrows. I just depict this for two particles to not uh, make the uh, graphic here too messy. And then in addition, like I said, particle swarm optimization, each particle is subject to randomness, so each um, particle um, is influenced by a random exploration given here by this um, Gaussian random vector. And since I cannot depict randomness, I just um, depicted here a couple of different samples. And this is to um, allow the algorithm to explore the objective function um, domain um, exactly. So the, this algorithm leverages somehow exploration versus exploitation. So the exploration is by the um, Brownian motion or by the randomness, and the exploitation is by the computation of the consensus point and the associated drift to the, um, this weighted average. Um, if there are questions, uh, don't hesitate to ask. I hope that's yes. Yeah, exactly. So alpha, uh, usually then this would, so a temperature would be then one divided by alpha, if, right? Yes? Is lambda just a scalar here? Yeah, exactly. So um, usually here you, one sets lambda to one because you can uh, then have the freedom by delta t, but it's um, something which will be fixed, and later on we will have some conditions on lambda and sigma to, to be able to get convergence. Uh, yes, so that's a good po question. Um, so the idea is that particles which are very far away from the consensus point are in a not good position, though they are not, uh, they are, um, they, they can explore somehow the domain more, and you allow them to have a bigger exploration. Okay, anything else? No, perfect. Um, so if you run the dynamic, usually the particles move around very randomly if you have just have a few particles, which um, is very hard to analyze because the particles, of course, they are correlated and they depend on each other, and that's why usually to do the analysis, you take a mean field perspective to be able to analyze this more rigorously. And um, this we try to visualize here by this first slide, so let me describe this um, more closely. Um, so what we do here is run consensus-based optimization with a lot of particles, so really a lot. I think we took here like 30,000, which is uh, overkill for the setting of a two dimensional non convex objective function, but we want to simulate here the mean field regime, so where you have really a lot of particles at, a, um, at your disposal, and we want to understand what happens there. And, and there, as it seems, is that um, so what we depict here is we run CBO with this many particles and for, um, for a couple of different runs. So we do this uh, experiment 100 times, and we fix throughout these 100 times three particles, which are always the same. And the other 30,000 minus three particles, they always uh, initial, initialized randomly. And these three particles, which we, um, which, uh, we followed through their uh, trajectory, and then we t depicted these trajectories. And you see that, unlike you would expect that these particles might move around the domain quite randomly and, and might explore like um, a lot, it seems that in the mean field setting, the particles move as they knew from the very beginning the global minimizer. So they move straight from their initial position to the global minimizer and almost move in a straight line to the global minimizer, okay? But this is because you're in the mean field regime and have a lot of information about the objective function. But this you can leverage to um, analyze the convergence behavior because you first analyze the mean field setting and then um, infer from this information about um, the interacting particle system with finitely many particles by doing a mean field approximation argument. Okay? So this is the first perspective. I'll have the um, technical result later. Um, any questions on that? You are raising your hand. Is there a fancy pattern in the background? Like 
That's the objective function. Yes. So, so you usually take alpha larger than below to be in the more formal statement later. Okay. Great. So, so as I said, or the talk was called two perspectives, so let me give you the other perspective. Because this is nice to do analysis, because you can prove something, because you have somehow non-convex objective function, but it seems that in the mean field limit it behaves more, more tractably. Um, but it doesn't give you a real intuition what would happen for a function uh, which is more um, usual in practice, because this one is very non-convex. Okay. So now imagine an objective function, which I think are typically uh, also prevalent in machine learning, which um, is like we call this Grand Canyon function because it's basically you have a river, okay, flowing from an initial position via some line, some river-like structure, to the global minimizer. But besides um, this river, you have canyons, so you have huge walls with, for instance, a high loss. And then um, if you follow the idea from this uh, plot on the left, uh, then you would expect that the particles move somehow straight through the canyons um, and not following the river. But this is very unintuitive th since every particle somehow evaluates their objective function and particles with a high objective function value should not uh, matter in the algorithm too much. So you would expect more that in particular this consensus point, which is this weighted average, flows along the river instead of moving straight like particles from their initial position to the global minimizer. And this is what we visualized here on the right. Um, and what will be the second more formal statement later on is that the consensus point actually follows this river from the initial position to the global minimizer. So what we depict here is the trajectory of the consensus point, again, for a couple of different runs. I think I took here 100 again. And I depict here by color um, the time. So um, the consensus point position at the beginning is depicted in blue, while its position at the end is depicted in, in more orange or red. And in addition, so this river is not a, a very natural river because it has a local maximum on its way. But nevertheless, um, the consensus point sometimes gets stuck here for a bit, but usually then finds by the random exploration, exploration of the method the global minimizer. Okay, so it seems that there is some connection to some gradient-like behavior, but it's um, not like gradient flow because you do not get stuck in a local minimum. This is the second thing I'll come to in a second. So let me first make more rigorous um, the first one. So I'll just give you very briefly the um, theoretical result. So you have this um, interacting particle system, and in the mean field limit, you can describe it by a partial differential equation, a Fokker-Planck equation of this form. And we want to understand um, the convergence of um, this um, measure rho t to a Dirac delta position at the global minimizer because you want to show the global convergence. And we can show that, um, now I'm coming back to these questions here, that if the function satisfies some reasonable tractability assumptions, in particular around the global minimizer, you want to be able to infer from the objective value you have how far away you are from the global minimizer itself. So you have some idea of a local inverse continuity condition. Um, and far away from the global consensus point, you want to just, this is the second uh, condition here, just exclude one setting, namely that very far away you do not have a local minimum with a very, or with a, uh, with a objective value very close to the global one. Because then if you get stuck here, you would really need a lot of particles to get to the global minimizer again. And then we can show that um, under for, diff for suitable choices on the um, parameters, so in particular what um, you asked before, two lambda being um, bigger than the exploration, and for a large enough alpha, this is what you asked, we can show that um, the solution to this um, PDE converges to, the, um, to a Dirac delta at the um, global minimizer up to any accuracy you want, but of course the parameters here depend on the accuracy and this all happens in finite time. Okay, do I have two minutes left? Okay, one. Then I rush through the last one here. Um, so this is now, okay. This is about the uh, second perspective here. So we want to under, uh, understand the trajectory of the um, consensus point. So we just um, want to analyze a iterative scheme of this form. This somehow just encodes the position of the consensus point at every time step. 
And for this, we can show again under reasonable assumption here, you need, of course, that the objective function is C1. Before, it was just continuous. Uh, continuous. Um, and you have some lambda convexity and lo local Lipschitz continuity. We can show that, again, for large enough alpha and with parameter choices um, lambda and sigma being suitable, um, where is the next one here? The consensus point essentially exhibits a gradient-like um, form. So the old consensus point, uh, the new consensus point is the old consensus point minus some gradient direction at the old consensus point plus some stochastic noise, which we contr can control with high probability depending on the parameters of the algorithm you had. So in particular, this becomes small if you make alpha large, if you have a couple of particles, if you take small time steps, and if you have a suitable scaling of your parameters. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK, we have time for some questions. And I see the first one over there. Thank you. Um, how does your result depend on basically the flatness of the energy landscape? Can you, for example, if you use a very, very over-parameterized problem, you have a 2D problem, but you use a thousand parameters. Yes. Uh, would this break your assumptions? No, so, so the, the crucial assumption is really this one. I think for the um, energy function you were describing, probably these parameters are pretty nice, in a sense, and, and they later on will affect this um, alpha parameter, where is it? Um, here, because this, of course, depends on the assumptions of your energy function, and this will be usually nicer. Something else which um, might be interesting here is, um, so this alpha depends, in the worst case, on the dimensionality of the, um, of the objective function. And at some point later on, uh, if you do this mean field approximation, which I mentioned, um, which determines how many particles you need to have a global convergence statement, you have some exponential dependence on alpha. So in general, it depends exponentially on the um, dimensionality of the problem, which is natural because the objective function here can be pretty convex. But maybe for a function you're describing, if you have some flatness, um, it could be, or some convexity also around the glowing minimizer, it could be um, useful to try to understand if somehow for special, special classes of function, this dependence is nicer. But just one comment. So what we assume throughout here is that um, the global minimizer is unique, which is a direct implication of this function. So if you have like, which is very often the case in machine learning, that if you have a valley of global minimizers, then this assumption would not hold. We have something currently we are working on, but this is not completely done yet. OK, thank you. Thank you. Very good. We have time for one last question. Marco. Thanks for the very nice talk and the very nice perspective. Um, I'm wondering if you can go the other way around in the sense that you showed that basically consensus-based optimization can access a gradient algorithm. Mm -hmm. But if I take a gradient algorithm for some optimization problem of your liking, can you rephrase it as a consensus-based optimization problem and use your machinery to analyze? This I have not thought about yet. Maybe next year, then. Yeah. <laughs> no, this would be interesting, yeah. Well, we have a lunch break to, to think about it now. <laughs> Let's thank all the speakers of this morning's session again. Oh, I am. And we'll reconvene at 2. Yes. Uh, let's say 2. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you so much. Thank you.